Good morning and happy Mother's Day to all the moms and mother figures out there. We're so thankful for all the love and care that you give to each of us. In fact, we want to celebrate you just a little bit today. And on the screen right now, you should see a QR code for Starbucks gift cards. Take a screenshot of that with your phone. Go through the drive through later today and you can have a coffee on us while supplies last. We also want to welcome you to Cross Point Church. If this is your first time here, you need to know that we exist to help people find and follow Jesus. So we hope that you experience him maybe for the first time today. And if you've been following him for a while, we hope that your faith is deepened uh, as we hear from God's word and worship him today. Today we're going to finish our series on Ruth, A Redeeming Story. It's been an incredible story, an incredible series that has real life application for us and our story, but it has also shown us how God is working on an even bigger story and how he's working through any and every situation. It's going to be a great day as we bring this story to a close and as we worship God together. So let's get started right now.
Pray, Cross Point. It's good to be with you today. I have a question uh, I'd like to ask you. Is there anyone in your family, anyone in your family tree that is famous? Someone that their name would be easily recognized. I was asking this very question with some friends of mine online uh, just recently, and I was surprised to find out that one of the guys I know is related to Vice President Mike Pence. Even more surprised to find out that one of the guys in his family tree is the famous actor Steve McQueen. One man had a Pulitzer Prize winning author and another man was related to a very well-known professional wrestler. Leslie's most famous relative is none other than Daniel Boone. The rest of us, well, we're boring. We're just normal. We come and go with little to no acclaim at all. It's funny how sometimes we single out that one person as if they are our claim to fame. And yet, the rest of us, we are just the human connection from one generation to the next. The story that we've been looking at, the story of Ruth in the Bible, is really kind of a funny story. It's not a story about the famous people in one ancestral line. It's actually about the not so famous people. Names in the family tree that most everyone else just reads right past. Today we're going to finish the book of Ruth. We're going to finish the story. It's actually an incredible, not so normal story about how God uses the, the brokenness of a widow whose faith is on her very last leg the hard work of a woman from another country, a foreigner, and the desire of one man to help one person. And in doing so, changes the destiny of not just a family or even an entire nation, but the destiny for everyone, everywhere, for all time. Like we did last week, I want to spend just a little bit of time reviewing the story that we've covered up to this point. Naomi is a married woman with two sons. And because she lives in a land where there's a famine going on, her entire family leaves the area of Bethlehem and goes to a land called Moab. While her family is there, her two sons marry women from that country, the country of Moab. And a short time later, all three of the men in her life, her husband and both of her sons, die. Now, there's just three widows with no one and nothing. We call this an unfortunate beginning. Naomi now is convinced that God is against her. Her life is cursed. And with that understanding, she tells her two daughter-in-laws that they need to leave her and go back home because she's got nothing at all for them. Now, one of the daughter-in-laws does, in fact, take her offer and goes back to her family. But the other, whose name is Ruth, in a very powerful and a very personal way, says that she will never leave Naomi. She will be with her until the end. She is the unselfish companion. So the two widows head back to Bethlehem, the area from which Naomi's family had come, and they begin to eke out a living, picking up the leftover grain from the wheat and the barley fields. Ruth's really hard work and her devotion to her mother-in-law, Naomi, are noticed by a very wealthy man named Boaz. He is also a prominent family member who has both the ability and the means to take their tragedy and turn it into a Cinderella-like storybook ending. And we call him an upright man. So Naomi, now knowing that Boaz is a family or kinsman redeemer, that's the position I was talking about that can turn a tragedy into triumph and change everything for everyone. She encourages Ruth to propose to Boaz and does so uh, in a very unusual way, in a very unusual place in the middle of the night. And we call that an unusual night. So we have an unfortunate beginning. We have uh, an unselfish companion. We have an upright man and an unusual knight. And that brings us to our final chapter in this story. An unlikely 
heritage. A couple of weeks ago, Trey shared with us that with the marriage of Boaz to Ruth, they would become the great grandparents of royalty. Their great grandson is the most famous king in the history of Israel, King David. And a thousand years later, David would be known as the most famous ancestor of a, a seemingly unknown and inconsequential carpenter from a small village called Nazareth. His name is Joseph, and he is known as the earthly father of Jesus. Last week, I shared with you that the story of God blessing Ruth isn't just about God blessing Ruth. It's about God blessing Ruth and Naomi. But it's not just about God blessing those two women. It's about God blessing all of those people in that area. In fact, generation after generation because of what's going to be happening. You've heard me talk about the eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. And in two of those eyewitness accounts, the authors list the lineage, the heritage of Jesus. In one of those lists, written by Matthew, there are famous names like Abraham, who's known as the father of many nations. Jacob, who had a ladder named after him. There, there are famous kings like Uzziah and Hezekiah and famous leaders in the temple like Zadok and Zerubbabel. And in the nearly 2,000 years and 42 generations of all the fathers that are listed there by Matthew, he goes out of his way to name only five women. Only five. And one of those women is Ruth. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5 says this, Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Jesus' royal lineage to King J David is likely the reason for Matthew listing all of that. But it's the unlikely heritage of Boaz that we're looking at now. That's what gets our attention. It's the story of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, a prostitute, who in turn marries a woman from a foreign land that no one was supposed to have anything to do with in any way, shape, or form, let alone marry someone from that place. And yet he does, in fact, redeem Ruth with that marriage he redeems a childless widow with nothing and no one to show for her life. It's the story that most, more closely reminds us of Jesus than his royal lineage. That's the significance of this. It's this story, the story of a redeemer that I believe has a lot of impact on my life and yours, on my story and your story. Because I want you to understand that even though life can be really hard at times and sometimes even tragic, I want you to know that God writes the final chapter in every story of every person who will ever live. Last week, I read from Ruth chapter 3, where Boaz had tentatively accepted the proposal of Ruth. She uh, approached Boaz not simply because he'd been really nice to her, but because he was, in fact, the kinsman redeemer, that man who has the power and the ability to change uh, lives who had had uh, a lot of uh, tragedy in it. And, and remember what I had told you about what those certain tragedies would, would be. The responsibility of a kinsman redeemer should a family member have a tragedy was to avenge the murder of a family member. A, a kinsman redeemer would bring justice. He also had the responsibility of looking after the needy and homeless family members. The, any kinds of tragedy that would cause those kinds of things. The kinsman redeemer would bring mercy and compassion. Also, the kinsman redeemer would buy back a family member who had been sold into slavery. The kinsman redeemer would bring freedom and hope. And also buying back fam, uh, family land that had been sold because of uh, any kind of a financial emergency. The kinsman redeemer, redeemer would bring security and time. And in the case of Ruth, as I discussed, kinsman redeemer would marry the widow, uh, the childless widow, of a deceased brother bringing identity 
and life back to the family. I said that Boaz had tentatively accepted. He informs Ruth that by invoking the kinsman redeemer understanding of what was going on, that there were now rules that had to be followed. And one of the rules that uh, Boaz lets uh, Ruth know about is that there's actually another kinsman redeemer, one that has greater authority, a nearer relative than himself. And he says to Ruth, if that man wants to redeem her and the land, then he will in fact do that. But if not, Boaz will redeem her. Now, the way that I said that makes Boaz seem uh, as if he's indifferent to Ruth and and the plight that she and Naomi are in. But make no mistake, Boaz is very interested in Ruth. He wants to redeem her. He really does. Let's read what happens then. Ruth chapter 4, starting with the first verse. Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer had mentioned, uh, just as the guardian redeemer mentioned had come along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said, To the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then, Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. So once again, just like last week, because of this cultural nuance, there's so much more in this story, in this chapter. Some of it is, in fact, veiled in the culture of the time, but the principles that are here are timeless. And you and I certainly can see them if we'll just dig a little deeper. The word redeem is a very powerful one in scripture, it means to buy back, to pay a price, to restore by paying a price. I told you again that the responsibilities of the kinsman redeemer involve buying back land or buying back someone that had been sold into slavery. This literally is a monetary payment, real money. And this money is going to be paid for property, whether the property is land or people, a slave along those lines. This is the very definition, the very application of what it means to be redeemed, to buy something or someone back. Let me give you a little bit more contemporary understanding of what's happening. Let's say that you're going to go buy a television and you walk into a store and you have a coupon, whether it's a physical piece of paper or maybe it's something that's on your phone. It's a digital coupon and you buy the TV and that coupon says 10% off. You show the coupon and the store owner gives you that TV for the price minus 10% of it. If you look at the coupon itself, whether it's the digital or or the physical, it doesn't matter. You look at the coupon and you read the fine print, more than likely it's going to say something like, this is redeemable at, or it can be redeemed by or redeemed with, something like that. The store then accepts the coupon as money. But now there's a problem. You see, they are 10% short in their sales. So what do they do? They go to the manufacturer of the TV from whom they bought the TV and they show the sales receipts that includes the coupon and the manufacturer actually buys back that document with real money. That's the point of redemption. It's what that really, really means. They buy those things back. They redeem it. That's what it's all about. This is the basic principle 
of redemption. Except now in our story with, with Ruth, we're not talking about electronics. The commodity, the commodity here is life. It's people. And because life is now involved, because people and families are now involved, because it's about a person, not everyone has the ability or the desire to be a redeemer. Not everyone really can, even if they wanted to. Not everyone can be a redeemer. The reason that not everyone can is because, firstly, redemption requires power. Redemption requires power. Without the authority to redeem someone, there can be no redemption at all. Boaz has the power to redeem Ruth, but someone else has a greater power, has greater authority to do so. But with that power to redeem comes a significant amount of responsibility. The responsibility not just to own the land, but to now take care of Ruth and the children that she will have in the name of her dead husband. The nearer kinsman wanted the land. He didn't want Ruth. He didn't mind caring for the land. He just didn't want to care for Ruth. That's the long and short of it. That's not redeeming the land. That's insider trading. That's saying you want the family price all the while saying you're not a part of the family. That's really what that's all about. He doesn't want to put his own inheritance, his own estate at risk by adding more members to the family and splitting it up even more so. So he declines. The nearer kinsman used his power to keep his own inheritance. Boaz wants to use his power to share his inheritance. That's what a redeemer does. Redemption requires power and redemption requires payment. Real money, as I said, is going to exchange hands here. A lot of money. I know that this is going to get a little into the family legal weeds, but I need for you to stick with me here and understand what's happening. What I believe is going on is that, remember, that Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two boys left the region of Bethlehem when the famine was going on. And when they did so, I think that Elimelech sold that land. But now that Elimelech is dead and both the boys are dead, Naomi has the first right to buy that property back because of the law of the kinsman redeemer. But uh, because of the law of redemption. But she can't. She has no means to do so and probably will ever have the means to be able to buy that land back. But a kinsman redeemer could buy it back for, for her. Boaz is that man. He has the means and now the authority to do so. And he can redeem uh, Ruth in that now remember uh, Naomi said that she can't she's too old she can't have children anymore but Ruth could have a son who could grow up and eventually take possession of that land again Boaz is going to get the land when he buys back everything when he redeems it he's going to get the land for now but if Ruth has a son in the name of her uh, dead husband that boy could grow up And take possession of the land. The land goes back to him. And all of the risk. All of the cost. All of the burden. Falls on the redeemer. And when it's all said and done. He gets nothing back for that. The only thing that the one being redeemed. Is really asked for. Is gratitude and devotion. Did you hear what I said? Are you starting to pick up. On what's coming. The nearer kinsman. Was willing to pay money. For his benefit. Boaz. Was willing to pay money. For someone else's benefit. Redemption. Requires power. And it requires payment. And finally. Redemption. Requires passion. Boaz had the desire, the willingness to redeem Ruth. Maybe uh, the, the nearer kinsman didn't want to redeem Ruth. Why? Maybe, maybe he believed what Naomi had believed, that God was actually 
uh, cur- cursing the family. After all, all the men in the family did die. Maybe it's not something like that. Maybe he just doesn't want to have anything to do with a woman from Moab. I'm not sure what it is, and I don't know. It, it doesn't really matter. He doesn't want to do that. What I know and what we know is that the near kinsman wanted the land, and he didn't want Ruth. That's all that there is to that. Do you remember the duties that I had described, the responsibilities of a kinsman redeemer. If you're a kinsman redeemer and you are going to need to avenge the murder of a family member, you have to want to do that. If you're a kinsman redeemer and you have to go buy back a family member who has been sold into slavery, you have to want to pay that price to buy them back, to get them their freedom. If you're a kinsman redeemer and and there's land that uh, a family member sold in the middle of a financial emergency and and you're going to want to buy that land back for them, you have to want to pay that price. And if you're the kinsman, kinsman redeemer, and you are going to marry a woman so that she will be protected, so that she can be provided for, all knowing that you may not get anything for this. If you are a kinsman redeemer and you buy a person out of slavery and they make another decision ending in their slavery again, and if you buy land back and that land that you bought back for a family member could be sold again and you get nothing for that, now you understand how heavy the burden is. Now you understand what that all means. If you're a kinsman redeemer, you have to want to redeem someone. You have to want to do that. Because redemption requires the passion to carry it out. The story of Boaz is such a good story. Such a powerful story. By the time we get to the end, the crowd is cheering Boaz, cheering what he's doing because they see just how much, just like we do, they see just how much Boaz truly loves Ruth, how far he was willing to go to redeem her, to provide for her, to help her, to take care of her for the rest of her life. And he didn't make this known in the middle of the night while no one was watching. At the end of the story, he publicly declares that he's going to take care of her. And he lets everyone know of his intentions. He sacrificed for Ruth because he thought Ruth was worth it. The position of the Redeemer is an extremely expensive one. The Redeemer absorbs all the cost, all the pain, all the burden, all the responsibility. The one being redeemed gets to have land, gets to have dreams, gets to have identity and hope again. And it costs nothing to the one being redeemed. Boaz was an honorable man in his role as a kinsman redeemer. And if that is true, and it is, If he is honorable, then Jesus, the one who is my redeemer, is most honorable in everything that we can see here. Jesus as my redeemer bought back my reputation when it was restored. Jesus as my redeemer bought me out of the slavery of my own sin. Jesus as my redeemer restored my identity when I had no one and nowhere to go. And having been redeemed, all Jesus asks of me is that he wants me to be faithful. He wants me to be grateful. And he wants me to be devoted for the rest of my life. Jesus has the power to redeem you just like he had the power to redeem me. Jesus wants to redeem you. Jesus has the power to redeem you. He wants to share his inheritance with you. Jesus paid the price to redeem you. He went to the cross and paid for your redemption with his blood. And Jesus loves you so much that he died to redeem you. He sacrificed his life for you 
because he thinks you're worth it. It's just that simple. It's powerful, but it's just that simple. Now, you may not have known that you have someone famous in your spiritual lineage. But you now, too, if you let Jesus be your redeemer, can have an unlikely, powerful heritage as well. What do you say? Will you let Jesus be your redeemer? God, thank you so much for when we were in our absolute worst state, our worst place, having the worst time of our life, you have provided a family redeemer, a, a powerful redeemer, a holy redeemer to buy us back, to save us, to rescue us, to restore us. God, it's almost too good to be true. We, we do want to read the fine print only to find out that everything that Jesus does is for us and everything that Jesus does is true. And so God, I pray for people who want to be redeemed. I pray for people who are crying out to be redeemed. God, I pray that you would help them to understand that Jesus died for them. He loves them and he redeemed them with his very own precious blood. Father, thank you for our Redeemer. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. We well, hope you've had a great time worshiping God and learning from his word today. In fact, if you've benefited from this digital experience, this online expression of church, uh, we'd ask you to consider supporting Cross Point Church. We have so many generous donors that, that make things like this possible, uh, and we always need more. We, we need more so that we can complete the mission of helping people find and follow Jesus. So if you'd like to support Cross Point Church, you can do that uh, through various ways. Uh, those options are all listed on the screen uh, right now. Again, we want to thank you for being here today. We hope you have a wonderful week, and we can't wait to see you back here again next week.